2023 marked 75 years of peacekeeping missions in the UN. In 1948, the Security Council authorized the deployment of UN military observers to the Middle East. This was the first ever peacekeeping mission. Since then, more than 70 peacekeeping operations have been deployed by the UN. Over the years, hundreds and thousands of military personnel, UN police and other civilians from more than 120 countries have participated in UN peacekeeping operations. So, looking only at the numbers, surely peacekeeping operations must have been a success. Recently, however, several countries have asked the UN to leave, including Mali and the Democratic Republic of Congo. So what is this a symptom of? Where are we? 75 years after the first UN peacekeepers set their foot on foreign ground. Is it still functional? Has it worked so far? And if so, will it continue to do so in the future? What is the future for peacekeeping? My name is Marie Furhoften and you're listening to an episode of the Nupi podcast, The World Stage. To understand the current state of peacekeeping operations, we need to first understand what it is we're talking about. And to help me with that, I sat down with Nupi researcher Cedric de Koning. He has more than 30 years of experience in the field and is, amongst other things, leading a network called EPOM that is evaluating the effectiveness of peace operations. Peacekeeping is one of those instruments that the United Nations use to manage international peace and security alongside peacemaking and peace building. And this refers to a specific instrument where there's two or more parties to a conflict that comes to an agreement about how to end that conflict. And then peacekeeping is a tool to help, for instance, monitor a ceasefire agreement or implement a peace agreement. And so it's really what we call a third party, so not the two parties to the conflict, but the United Nations, a third party deploying, typically in some form of operation, to help implement a ceasefire or a peace agreement. Cedric explains that there are three principles for peacekeeping. Consent, impartiality and minimum use of force. So consent basically means that the parties to the conflict must themselves have agreed to come to, to, come to a ceasefire or a peace agreement and then they consent to the United Nations deploying a peacekeeping operation to support them. So basically it means you can't impose peace. You must be invited to support a peace process. And impartiality means you don't take sides uh, when in that process of helping to implement the peace agreement. And then the minimum use of force basically means that you can't again enforce peace you are assuming that these parties have decided to come to a point where they, they end their conflict and your role is to help to support that. You may have to defend yourself in that process. Sometimes there's uh, you know, incidents or there are other parties outside those parties that have agreed to the conflict um, that may put peacekeepers to risk. And in more recent years, we have added additional tasks like protecting civilians that peacekeeping operations, whilst they are helping to implement this peace agreement, should also help to protect civilians who are at risk of uh, you know, some form of aggression. And so to perform those tasks, peacekeepers can use force, but always proportional and the minimum force necessary to, to protect themselves or those they've been mandated to protect. Okay. So with the principles for peacekeeping in mind, consent, impartiality and minimum use of force, have peacekeeping operations throughout the years been successful? Yes and no. Says Tor Henrik Andersen, Minister Counselor at the Norwegian Mission to the United Nations in New York. He is leading a team that works on peace and security, and in particular peace operations and African issues in the Security Council. I don't think that we can say definitely that peace operations has been successfully all over the place because it depends very much on the context and uh, specific situations. And he's not the only one with this analysis of peacekeeping operations. David Harry leads the Division for Policy, Evaluation and Training in the Department of Peace Operations in the UN. We can definitely say that it has been an effective conflict management tool. The starting point, though, is to consider that we're going to very difficult places 
where there are violent disagreements about the direction a country should take or between two countries that are difficult to resolve. And so the effectiveness of any tool like peacekeeping depends on a lot of complex factors and success is never guaranteed. But what has, I think, been clear is that peacekeeping has succeeded in many different locations. And one of the reasons it's been successful is that it has allowed the international community to come together to bring resources from multiple countries and the political will of the Security Council and the international community to assist parties to a conflict, either to maintain peace or actually move fully to uh, concluding conflict and getting countries back on the path to, to peace. The record is not one of 100% success, but I think that it has proven to be a remarkable tool and when we look back at it, we shouldn't assume that all of this was a tool we pulled out of the toolbox. It was all created and evolving on the fly. So I, for example, have been involved in a mission in Liberia where the UN was working alongside a sub-regional organization, ECOWAS, observing a transition. I've worked in a mission where the UN was asked to be the government of Timor as it was becoming independent. I've worked in a mission where there were uh, few uh, troops, um, but much more of a focus on the civilian support uh, to political uh, transition. So all of these were actually uh, adaptations to the particular circumstances. Um, and I think that's important to remember. Sometimes we can look back at these things and say, does X or Y work as if we were picking up a, a tool and finding it, it did or didn't fit the plug. Uh, but in fact, um, uh, they're all a result of, of quite a lot of uh, uh, adaptation. Mm. Um, and I think that that's also an important thing that we should consider as we look forward because the future will not be like the past. So the future will not look like the past, David says. But to understand the future, we must look at the past. Amongst the numerous peacekeeping operations that has been initiated since 1948, the very first one marks 75 years in 2023. It's the United Nations True Supervision, or UNSO for short. Annika Hilding Norberg is the head of peace operations and peace building at the Geneva Center for Security Policy. And she is one of several experts that are now working on an evaluation of this mission. UNSO is, uh, is an absolutely fascinating uh, mission. It's the first ever peacekeeping uh, mission or others would also say it's a special political mission established by the United Nations in the wake or after the conclusion of the Second World War. And it was a way in which to try to settle the issues when the Israelis were returning, the Jews were returning from Europe uh, after the war and also uh, where Palestinians were living. So it was a way in which to try to calm the situation and uh, hopefully usher in a period of peace. That was not the case. Um, it was much more complex and it, as we see today, the complexities remain today. But UNSO as a mission... UNSO is a rather small mission, Annika explains, and it's the only peacekeeping mission with a regional mandate, meaning that they can have conversations and communicate between the five countries in this region, being Israel, Lebanon, Syria, Egypt and Jordan. The mission consists of unarmed military observers. They observe, report and facilitate liaisons. And it's really, uh, it's there to um, uh, observe the interstate borders between these countries. So for instance, ANSO doesn't have a role in relation to Gaza because that's within uh, Israel's um, international borders, if you like. Depending on conflict cycles and wars erupting, uh, ANSO has remained in the region. They haven't left. Many other missions have to leave. Uh, uh, when, when there's a full uh, war um, breaking out, but uh, ANSO has remained, so they might rebalance their, their position. It's the only mission that therefore can have uh, the conversation and, and or rather the, the, the communicating messages between uh, warring countries uh, across the five countries. So according to Annika, ANSO has been an important mission for the UN and its work is still ongoing. But if the missions are so successful, why hasn't there been deployed any new ones since 2014? Surely there's enough conflict in the world, so why are we seeing 10 years without new peacekeeping missions? 
Cedric de Koning at Nupi explains that there are several reasons for this. Firstly, it, a major reason was financial. Um, so we had the global uh, financial crisis. Uh, then we had the Trump administration who specifically had a strategy to reduce expenditure on peacekeeping operations because America is the largest contributor to the costs related to peacekeeping. And this is based on GDP, China's the second largest and so on. And um, so th those are all important reasons. But I think another important reason is that there has been a number of operations in the last 10, 15 years, which have been given tasks which I think went further than what peacekeeping was intended to do. We can call these stabilization operations. And in many of these operations, that, like in the Democratic Republic of Congo, in Mali and Central Africa Republic, there isn't really a clear viable peace process or ceasefire or political project. And so the missions have been mandated to focus mostly on creating stability, assisting those governments uh, to you know, protect them and, and, and fight against insurgent groups, for instance, in the Democratic Republic of Congo, and to protect civilians. Peacekeeping is, is really at its most successful when there is a peace to keep, when there is a political project to support. And the fact that these missions lack that meant that they have been going on for a for a long time and that it's been become increasingly unclear you know what their contribution to the to the situation is clearly they are saving lives those situations would probably have been much worse if the peacekeeping missions weren't there but at the same time um, the conflict is continuing and the peacekeeping operations kind of become embroiled in that process and so i think also a frustration built up around um, the lack of, uh, let's say, effectiveness of those type of operations. Um, and this all, of course, is taking place in the context of a changing global order, so an increased rivalry in the Security Council. In addition to no new operations, several UN missions in Africa are under pressure. Last year, the Malian government asked the UN to leave the country. And since peacekeeping is consent-based, the Security Council approved the complete withdrawal of the UN peacekeeping forces in Mali. The last soldier had to leave Malian ground by 31st December last year. I asked Thor Hendrik at the Norwegian mission to the UN to tell me more about the situation in Mali and in Africa in general. The peace operations we hear most about today are peace operations in Africa. And now we're in a specific time uh, of history of the 75 years of peace operations, where many of these rather big operations are now being drawn down, dismantled, or closed down because the host countries don't want them anymore. I think Mali is a specific example where the host country was very strong communicating to the international community and the Security Council that they didn't want a peace operation in their own country which then made it impossible for the UN and the Security Council to renew the mandate, and they had to draw down. The interesting question is, what will now happen in Mali? Will Mali go from a situation where there has been a lot of turmoil over many years, and where the peace operation that has been in place in Mali actually have kept, you know, contributed to keeping parties apart, protecting civilians, what will happen when that disappears? Will there be more peace in Mali? Will there be more protection of civilians? Or will we see war and trouble and violence uh, reoccurring and re-emerging? I fear the latter. I fear that the lack of peace operation actually will turn into a sort of vacuum, security vacuum that might be filled by battling parties or uh, groups, insurgent group, terrorist groups that we don't really want to see um, emerging. And now we're seeing the same development in many countries in Africa, Tor Henrik explains. There is a push to have the UN-led operation in DR Congo out of the DRC. There has been made a decision in the Security Council to terminate the mandate of a political mission in Sudan called UNITEMS. And in Somalia, the peace operations are under pressure financially and mandate-wise, and experts say it will most likely be a drawdown on some stage. And I think we're now seeing 
possibly the biggest change of peace operations taking place in 75 years. And probably we have seen in our, uh, that maybe it's, it's a bit dangerous to say in our lifetime, but um, so far that the peak of these huge African-led peace operations and something new will have to emerge after this. So what is this new that has to emerge? What can experts tell us about the future? Are UN peacekeeping missions suited for the current state of the world? And where do they see peacekeeping going for the next five or ten years? Are UN peacekeeping operations fit for the future? They never have been. At the same time, they always have been. Says Annika Hilling Norberg. I think there's always been challenges with the missions and there's always been shortcomings. And Sometimes people have asked, Annika, why do you focus on peacekeeping? I've been at it for 29 years, I realized. But I think for all its shortcomings, it is the most universal, the most inclusive, the most representative tool that we have. Tor Henrik at the Norwegian mission to the UN agrees. Absolutely. Peace operations in one or another form will be very relevant. But it probably needs to be more consistently combined with political process. From a UN perspective, David Harry underlines the importance of the flexibility the different missions have. The UN is capable of providing a lot of different options in a spectrum, let's say, of peace operations. If you're talking about peacekeeping in the context of deploying into countries, then you need to ha have an answer to three questions. How much political support do they need? How much security support do they need? And how much support to build state institutional capacity and do peace building do they need? And multidimensional peace building brings all of those three together. But it may be that the UN can assist in situations where all three aren't required or all three aren't acceptable. And I think we need to understand the UN's work in, in that context as well. The last thing I want to say is that in the context of much more global division and superpower contention, it can be harder to reach a consensus around deploying complex missions with multiple mandates. But we mustn't forget also that peacekeeping's beginnings were in situations where there wasn't a clear political consensus. It was the Cold War when peacekeeping was invented. And peacekeepers were deployed in what we sometimes call now traditional missions to provide a buffer between armed groups that had not yet and still may not be ready to reach peace, but provide enough confidence to maintain a ceasefire. And that is a very important preventive effect that over years may help to contain conflict even while a full resolution might not be available. We may see this come back to the fore as we're in a world where complex political solutions might not be found, but the Security Council might still want to contain conflict and deploying peacekeepers to provide a security guarantee, confidence between two armed groups which are pitched up side by side, communication between them, uh, this may be also important. Nupikolag Centric de Kooning predicts the following development of peacekeeping operations. I think in the short term we will continue to see this contraction or retrenchment of, of peacekeeping. Um, I think in the medium to long term peacekeeping will adapt to to whichever form the the new institutions or the transformed United Nations will take. Uh, I think, as we've seen during the Cold War, that uh, smaller missions that are less costly, that are less politically sensitive, including you know, military ceasefire observer missions like we've seen in the Middle East during the Cold War, and these special political missions are, are more likely to be the kind of instruments that the United Nations use rather than large, big, ambitious peacekeeping operations like we've seen during the last 30 years or so. But over time, I think, uh, you know, peacekeeping will remain as, as one of the most visible instruments of international cooperation in the area of peace and security. Um, so I think we will continue to see peacekeeping and, and most probably after some years of adaptation, peacekeeping will return again in a, in a larger, more proactive form that we've seen in the past. So according to the experts, there is a future for peacekeeping, although it will face big challenges in the years to come. 
exactly how UN peacekeeping will look in another 75 years from now is impossible to predict. But nothing is pointing to a direction where the international community chooses to stop peacekeeping missions altogether. The world is changing, and so will the peacekeeping missions have to do as well. You have listened to an episode of the Newbie podcast, The World Stage. If you want to know more about the Effectiveness of Peace Operations Network, IPON, or other Newbie-led UN research, you can visit our website at newbie.no slash en. And make sure to subscribe to The World Stage to not miss the next episode. Thank you for listening.